Hello, hello, and welcome to the Autism 360 podcast, The 360 Method, a weekly podcast where we chat about everything Autism 360. Every week, we'll be catching up with you, with what's going on in the program, and with our team members, and every week, I'm lucky enough to be joined by our mindset coach extraordinaire, Renee Tate. Hello, Hello. Renee. Hi, Ella. Hello. How are you out there today? And um, really excited to be here today. It's um, another great topic, so Mm -hmm. looking forward to discussing it today. Yes. I am your coach, Ella Bailey, Autism 360 veteran coach and explorer of all things parenting support. Uh, So welcome to you, our lovely listeners. Uh, We care about you, your thoughts, your experience, uh, and whether you're a member of the program or not, we would love to hear from you. So please do reach out. Um, Our email address is hello at autism360.com. We would love your feedback. We'd love your ideas for future episodes, your ideas on past episodes. Um, Yeah, please do drop us a line. So before we start on today's topic, I have a couple of disclaimers. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we live and work and from from whose land we are broadcasting this podcast today. Um, And also just a disclaimer that this podcast does not substitute uh, for medical advice. If you have concerns about your child, please do seek medical and allied health advice. This is meant to be supportive and community, but doesn't substitute for medical care. So today we are chatting about demands after school. Um, So this one uh, is interesting because um, I get a lot of parents, and I'm sure Renee gets this as well, wondering, you know, I just want my kiddo to tell me how their school day was, and it's really tricky. After school time is hard, there's lots of fighting, um, and always lots going on. Have you heard of this, Renee? Yes, I have experienced it myself as well, yeah. Ella, and um, I think it's, yeah, it's a really busy time of the day it as is. well, so everyone's sort of landing all at the same time home, and there's a lot of different dynamics going on, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely, mm. lots of moving parts, lots of things that have got to get done, and so what I wanted to talk about today, what we want to talk about today, is how you can reduce the demands of your after-school time. I think it's really important to remember that um, kids on the spectrum are doing a whole lot more um, work at school than just their academic work. You know, a neurotypical child may not be having to put a whole lot of extra um, cognitive work into things like socialising, into things like um, following instructions or really consciously having to work on doing things like, um, you know, managing their emotions or or whatever. And so I think... um, Often the reason that kids on the spectrum aren't able to kind of communicate really effectively or not willing to kind of give us a full debrief of their day is because they're more exhausted than your average. They've, um, their output has been greater during the day. They've been dealing with things that um, we can't even really um, understand as having to deal with, um, and that makes them exhausted. Um, And I think uh, something that I'd really like to kind of help parents understand um, is how to define a demand. What does a demand mean? What does it mean to be placing a demand on our child? And so I would say a demand is really anything that um, a person is required to do that is other than... um, anything that returns them to homeostasis. So that sounds a little bit technical, but it just means anything that you're asking your child to do that doesn't involve kind of actively relaxing, actively soothing themselves, um, calming themselves is a demand. So demands can look like all kinds of things. It can be, you know, really obvious things like homework, um, putting their socks and shoes away, unpacking their bag, those kinds of things are all demands. Um, But it can also be things like, eating. Um, That is something that is other than um, just totally relaxing to them. Or it can be something like um, telling them how your day was or, um, you know, communicating in in a way that isn't relaxing to them. So all those things are demands and all those things can um, increase the likelihood of um, overwhelm and then overwhelm leading to things like meltdowns, um, behaviours dysregulated, kids, that sort of thing. So that's my first kind of point around um, this topic. How do we define a demand? 
just to reduce those demands, Ella, at that time of the day? Is that the is that the key to look at, you know, maybe not putting too many on at that time mm. when they've just arrived home? Yeah, home it certainly could be. It certainly could be. And I think um, probably even um, understanding a definition of demand is a good place for parents to start because mm-hmm. then they can recognise how many demands they are actually placing. Yeah. So we might just think, you know, all I asked them to do was, you know, unpack their bag or whatever, when really what you're asking them to do is respond to you, make eye contact, mm-hmm. um, follow an instruction, process that auditory information, um, come into contact with items that might be kind of um, uncomfortable in a sensory way. So there's actually a lot more demands than we might think that we're placing. Um, and I guess uh, more than anything, it just gives us more of an insight into why our afternoons may not be going to plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good tips. And it is um, it is true. I think sometimes we, we don't probably consciously think about those things in that way. So very good to um, look at it in that regard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my, my second uh, point that I wanted to, to, to bring to this conversation um, is the idea of uh, – your default network mode. So this is probably a new term, for, and it is for most people. Your default network mode is um, the the system of your brain that kicks in when you're not necessarily consciously engaged with anything. So um, a lot of people notice this kind of thing when they are doing something like long distance driving on a long straight road, or that you're standing in line um, at uh, at Woolies, kind of not thinking about anything, not checking your phone. Lots of people think of it as like staring off into the distance <laughs> or whatever. And then you suddenly notice, oh, I've just been, how long have I been here? Exactly. And that's interestingly um, its own cognitive process. And it's called your DNM, your default network mode. And what that brain network is doing, it kind of, um, it's mostly up around the front here. Um, But uh, what that is actually doing is clearing out all your brain's waste products that it's been doing, um, that it's been creating during the day when you're thinking hard, when you're concentrating, your attention is on things, you're processing information, your brain is creating all these waste products and you need to stop thinking (laughs) in order for your brain to process them. And once you do that, that's when your DNM kicks in, your default network mode. And so I would really say that because your kiddo is dealing with so much more than your average kiddo, they have even greater need to be able to kick into that default network mode. Another thing the default network mode does is allows you to encode memories. So that's when your brain is turning things from your short-term memory into long-term memory. And specifically for school kids, it's when um, the information that they've learned during the day is actually being processed. You know, it's not just being held in that really short-term memory. It's going into longer term. It's um, becoming congruated with the rest of the information that they're storing. And so I would say um, your default network mode is where your kids need to be after school. They need to be low low input, uh, minimal output, and um, doing our best to give them space and time to kind of stare off into space, let their brain shut down a little bit um, and really start doing those kind of almost you could think of it as like a maintenance process really where they're um, able to process the things that they've learned at school. And so my my argument is for reducing demands after school, if our kids don't get the opportunity to go into DNM after a whole day of school, when are they going to when are they going to process that information mm-hmm. you know they're going straight from school say to i don't know speech pathology or they're going straight from school to tutoring or whatever and not to say that those things are bad but just to consider okay well the times that they're awake when are we letting them have the opportunity to just kind of slow their brain down a little bit um Uh, get a little bit more present, be a little bit slower um, with the things that we're asking them to do. So I would say seek out times when you can create that for your kiddo after school Mm -hmm. by reducing demands. You know, it's going to be helpful in the long term. It's going to make school more valuable Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to be looking at far less things like frustration and exhaustion-based behaviours and meltdowns after school, um, which I think is a benefit for all of us. 
Absolutely, Ella. What a great tip. And I guess it changes that whole concept of, you know, we need to be talking in the car on the way mm. to here or, you know, maybe it's just like, you know what, it's okay if we're just mm. staring off into space or, um, you know, there's not all this conversation going on. I think it just changes the way that we see those, those times, um, which mm. is a really great tip. Yeah, yeah. And you make such an interesting point, Renee, because um, the inch and not that they're all bad, but the introduction of things like iPads and smartphones and, you know, media going all the time has really reduced the amount of available windows that children and adults have to be in DNM mode, mm -hmm. um, right? So um, when you're scrolling through Instagram, when your kid is scrolling through YouTube, your brain doesn't have that opportunity to go into maintenance mode, to go into DNM. So, you know, those moments in the car where, you know, your kiddo is just like watching the lines go by are even more valuable. I just, I love that. Let them be bored. Nothing to do is perfect. Absolutely. Such a, such a good tip. And I think even just using your imagination, you know, mm -hmm. those things, I think sometimes, yeah, they, they have so much stimulation. So mm -hmm. absolutely really Great, great tip, Ella. Mm. Um, yeah, it's um, funny that kind of intersects with what I was about to bring up, which is um, around screens. So everybody knows, I'm sure you're familiar, that screens are can be a struggle after school. And I think the reason that that is, um, just to kind of get a little bit neurochemistry nerd on you, is because our kiddos are so depleted after school, they need a dopamine hit. They want some endorphins. They want to feel good. They want to feel... Um, like they've got a bit of a pep in their step. And screens, especially um, videos and games designed for children, have um, have been kind of um, dopamine on steroids um, designed to hook kids in by giving them kind of low-level dopamine bursts as soon as they're on that game. Mm -hmm. um, and that's such a – that's such a um, – uh, it can be well. It causes a lot of struggles for a lot of families after school, um, but I think that that's one of the underlying reasons. Um, so, and I would say certainly that screens themselves are, you know, they're morally neutral. They're neither good nor bad. There's a lot of kind of social commentary about them, but screens are just like anything else in that they are a tool, um, and they can be either used for good or for, you know, not so good. Um, and I would say. Um, if we harness screens as a helpful tool to help our family um, get through the afternoon, um, that's our best bet for creating, you know, a successful evening, um, an afternoon um, where we can lower demands uh, and that kind of thing. So I'd say figure out how managing screens is going to work for your family. Don't let um, the kind of social commentary dictate um, the boundaries that you put in around your children. Examine the way that your children engage with screens, what you want out of that situation, um, and figure out, okay, well, what's a way that I can make screens work for our family in the afternoons? Engage in the process. Don't let it just kind of <laughs> wash over you. Um, and you can use screens really effectively to reduce demands um, uh, in, in the evening is something that I would say. What are your thoughts, Renee? I'm curious. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, look, I think being proactive about it is really important to have a plan rather than, you know, uh, if we're not sort of a, um, on the front foot with these things, I think that's when things can get really chaotic. So just going into it proactively, like you said, you know, being aware of those things to start with, but also having a plan of, well, what is our afternoon routine? Um, that routine and structure is important. And looking at how do we make these things work for us. If there is a little bit of screen time or whatever those things are, um, having a, a set plan around that because children, you know, they thrive on that structure and that routine. Um, so that will definitely help reduce a lot of uncertainty and a lot of chaos. I uh, think also just setting yourself up for success, you know, things like when you pick them up in the car or if when they get home, maybe just have some nice calming music on in the background, you know, set the scene for everyone to just sort of calm down. And the more that you can stay calm yourself and be proactive around that, knowing that, you know, they may get home and have a bit of a meltdown, you know, that that is there is a likelihood that that can happen. And rather than thinking, why does my child, you know, they can behave all day at school, but they get home and then they they lose it. Um, and I do hear parents saying that, but I think the good news is, is that yes, they are able to keep it together at school, which may have taken a lot of effort for them. 
And so the fact that they feel comfortable enough to get home and sort of let it all out um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, they feel safe at home. Home is their emotional adventure playground where they can be themselves. And that doesn't mean that, you know, we allow that, you know, any like behavior whatever but it definitely means that just maybe just be prepared for that that they may need to do a little bit of um, unloading of emotions when they get home and just you know if you're mentally prepared for that first of all creating a nice environment is helpful but also if you can be prepared for that it's going to allow you to stay calm and the more you can stay calm the more you're going to help your child because if if we when we get anxious they pick up on our anxiety and it's almost like we fuel each other so i think just yeah being conscious that okay afternoon let's have a plan i'm going to you know set the home up or the environment up try and just calm everyone down you know have a bit of a a, a good structure and a routine in place um so that everyone knows what to expect rather than we're all you know juggling all these different things um, but be be prepared that they may just be, you know, need to let out a little bit of emotion and a little bit of steam and just go, you know, that that's okay. I'm not going to react. I'm prepared that that could happen and, and we've got a game plan in place. Um, so, yeah, I think those things really help us to not be shocked and surprised. Um, but look at it as, you know, it's nice that they feel safe and comfortable enough to be able to get home and, and let it out a little bit um, if that's what's happening because they've worked really hard to keep it together all day, which is actually a really good thing. Um, and I wouldn't see that as a, a, a negative thing. So, yeah. Yeah, spoken like a true um, experienced mum there. <laughs> she knows what it takes. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes, well, I think, you know, we, um, we get better at these things over time, but I think sometimes just taking that expectation off um, mm. our children and ourselves. Um, can really definitely help us to manage those things a lot better. Yeah, yeah. certainly. And interesting that you mentioned um, expectation because I always feel like parents are so um, uh, that meltdowns are always so, uh, so you know unexpected um, or whatever and that that when when your expectations don't match up with um, the reality of the situation that's when emotions get high that's when frustration happens Mm -hmm. Um, however if we know okay well every day my kiddo has a meltdown usually around this time um, having our expectation that we're going to need to support our kiddo at that time to help them cope with these big emotions brings down our own frustration Right, and that's um, so much a part of being able to be there for our kiddos for the long haul, you know. And I think um, if we can match our expectations with um, what our afternoons actually look like, it's going to help us all to cope um, emotionally a little bit better. Um, so that's uh, all from us today, Renee. Any action points for our lovely listeners this week? Well, look, I would just um, just yes ask you, you know, what would be the biggest takeaway from today uh, for you, and also what could you action from those tips today? Maybe it's just something simple like, um, you know, I'm going to allow us to have that nice downtime in the car, or when we get home, we just have some nice quiet music and everyone just decompresses a little bit. Uh, Sometimes just, you know, implementing one or two things can really make it a difference to set you, you, you and your family up for success. So I would just really encourage you to have a think about what can you action from that today. And um, we look forward to hearing your feedback as well and any questions you may have around that also. Absolutely. I can't wait to hear um, how our families go with um, trying out these tips. Maybe um, drop us a line. We'd love to hear about it. Um, And we will uh, come back to you next week with another uh, autism parenting topic. Uh, Until then.